not? Okay, very good. Good morning, good morning. I really do not want to be lecturing at you folks for an hour and 15 minutes, so uh, I, I want to make some preliminary comments and, and maybe throw out some thoughts and talk a little bit about uh, the federal system and, and uh, contrasting that to state systems and some other things. But then I really want to engage you in the discussion. I really hope that uh, this will be a two-way discussion and not simply me talking at you. I don't even like to listen to me talk for an hour, so I know you don't want to listen to me talk for an hour. But let me tell you first a little bit about myself. I have been, this year makes 21 years in corrections. I started when I was 12. And uh, so I'm actually only 33 years old or whatever that adds up to. But I, I, this is my 21st year. I spent three years in juvenile corrections in the state of Ohio uh, after getting my master's degree. I got my bachelor's degree in psychology, master's degree in counseling and rehabilitation, and then started working at a juvenile detention center and a community mental health center. And on the community mental health side, I worked with uh, uh, pre-adjudicated delinquents, uh, kids that were getting into trouble with the law but hadn't actually gone to court yet. And then in the detention center, I worked with those who had already been adjudicated. Spent three years there and then decided to go back and get my doctorate uh, at West Virginia University in counseling and rehabilitation. And I got a wonderful internship with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And my internship was going to pay me more than I was making at the juvenile detention center. So I thought, that's a deal. So I went back and worked on my doctorate and worked at the federal prison in Morgantown, West Virginia not really planning to stay in prison work. I really, it was kind of a way to get back into graduate school, but didn't really plan to stay in prison work. But I absolutely fell in love, and I just found that to be such a rich and vital environment. If you're interested in human behavior, if you're interested in, in making a difference and uh, trying to affect positive change, uh, both in systems and in individuals, uh, corrections is just a, uh, just a dramatically wonderful field to work in. And I got hooked, and I went ahead and finished my doctorate, and have now been with the federal prison system for 18 years. Started as a psychologist, psychology intern, then a psychologist, and then chief psychologist at our prison in Morgantown, West Virginia. From there, I, went, I spent eight years there. And then I went to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. We have a training academy there where we train all new people coming into the Bureau of Prisons. They spend three weeks in basic training there. So I went down there as a senior instructor, then went on to Fort Worth, Texas, as associate warden as our, at our prison, our federal correctional institution there in Fort Worth, then back to the training center in Glencoe as director of training, not just for that academy, but for training across the entire Bureau of Prisons, uh, was responsible for that for a couple of years, and then to our federal correctional institution in Butner, North Carolina, which is a psychiatric facility. One third of the population there are in an inpatient psychiatric hospital. And with the other two-thirds of the population, we have a sex offender program, drug treatment program, and then just a general population. So it's a very heavily intensive program-oriented institution. Went from there to Washington, D.C. as an assistant director of the Bureau of Prisons. That was in 1989. And then about three years later, became director. I've been director now. It'll be 15 months next week. And uh, so it's been a very interesting and fascinating last year. Let me tell you a little bit about the federal system as compared to the state systems and, and how we're different. Um, we used to be very different. It used to be very clear what were federal offenses and what were the kinds of things and the crimes that people had to commit to go into federal prison versus state prison. Back in the early 1900s, about the only things that you could do uh, were crimes against the uh, security of the country, treason, and those kinds of things as a federal offense. Uh, offenses that took you across interstate commerce uh, that involved uh, shipments and issues moving from state to state so that no singular state had jurisdiction over the offense. Kidnapping eventually became a federal offense because they were usually snatching someone and usually taking them out of state or out of their home area. Then bank robbery became a federal offense because the banks were insured by FDIC. You always see the FDIC thing on the front of the bank. It's the Federal Depositors Insurance Company, I believe it is. But because it was insured federally, that became a federal offense. And so for probably the first half of this century, there were a relatively small number of offenses, also offenses that occur on federal property. On military bases, if not tried in military court, could be federal on, on Indian reservations, on uh, United States Forest property, United States Park property, all of those are all federal offenses. But in around the, around the 80s primarily, it sort of started eroding as the years went on. But Congress kept passing more and more laws that made more and more offenses triable both in state court and in federal court. And right now, if you look at what's happened, it's really difficult to really determine what fen offenses are federal and which ones are state because most of the laws now overlay on each other and almost any offense can be tried either state or federal. What's happened is 
Uh, the states and the feds tend to get in discussion when someone's arrested on a lot of offenses, and they sort out which, which, which way of trying it's going to get them the most amount of time and the harshest sanction. And those that get the harshest sanction tend to come into the federal prison system. And that's especially true with drug offenses in this country today. Because of the changes in laws at the federal level, which has increased the amount of time, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimum sentencing, has resulted in drug offenders in this country doing three times as much time now in the federal system than they did just six years ago. Used to be the average amount of time an inmate would do on a drug offense at the federal level was about 29 months. Today it's 79 months. They're doing more than triple, no, it's almost triple, uh, the amount of time they had done previously. So we end up now in the federal system with 60% of our population are there for drug treatment, I mean for drug offenses. And about half of those require drug treatment. So 30% of our entire population have drug treatment needs. Between the year 1950 and about 1980, our population at the federal level stayed between 20 and 30,000 inmates. It'd go up a little, go down a little, go up a little, go down a little, but stayed pretty well within 20 and 30,000 inmates. In early 1980, at the federal level, they started pushing law enforcement a lot harder. A lot more agents were hired by the FBI and the DEA and the Marshal Service. A lot more federal judges were put into place, a lot more U.S. attorneys, and they started pushing federal crime a lot harder. And our population started going up. Then in 1984, with the Crime Control Act, or the, uh, what's it called? The crime, I'm blocking. Uh, yeah, it was the Crime Control, uh, well, it was the, crime, the new crime bill in 1984 was passed, which created the United States Sentencing Commission, which changed the kinds of sentences that you would get at the federal level. It took the discretion away from the judges, and it made it pretty much just a formula. If you committed offense X, and you have X prior record, then you're going to get this amount of time. No debate, no considering of your background, no considering of the resources that you might have available to you should you stay in the community or not. It took the discretion away from the judges and made it a very absolute, you commit this offense, you have this background of offenses, you go away for this amount of time. Well, that amount of time was much, much higher than it used to be that inmates would do in our system. They also took away parole. They said, we want inmates to do the exact amount of time that they're given by the courts. None of this letting them out early. So they took federal parole away from us in the federal prison system. They also cut the amount of good time we could give. We used to be able to give a fair amount of good time for good conduct and also an additional amount of good time if they got involved in programs and things that really made them a better uh, escape, or, I mean, a better um, conduct risk once they got back into the community. They took that away from us, and now we can only give inmates 54 days a year good time, which means I think in the state of Texas right now you do an average of 23 days on a year. So if you get 10-year sentences, you do 10 times 23 days. The federal system, you do 300, what's, what's 300, what's 54 from 365? 311. In the federal system, you do 311 days on a year. For every year that you get sentenced, you do 311 days, and there's no way to cut that shorter, no way at all. And also then Congress started passing mandatory minimum sentencing. So they said if you commit this offense, you get a flat 10 years. If you commit that offense, you get a flat 15 years. If you commit another offense, you get a flat 20 years. It was very much locked in as to what the sentences were going to be. Our population then really began to skyrocket in the middle 1980s. Remember now I told you our population went for 30 years between 20 and 30,000 inmates. We now have 91,000 inmates in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And the projection is that by the end of this decade, we're going to have 130,000 inmates. The only system larger than us right now is the California Department of Corrections, which has about 120. But Texas is fast approaching. It right now is number three. But with the building plan they have underway, and actually if they counted, I think all of those that are sitting in the county jails right now, because they simply don't have room for them in Texas prisons, they probably would pass us up and be number two. So prisons... Uh, Prisons is a growing business, very dramatically growing today, with all the debate that's going on about getting tough on crime, making our streets safer, all the debate going on about the crime bill right now and what should the country's response be to the fact that our, our, our communities are unsafe, our citizens are feeling uh, beleaguered by crime and they're afraid. What should the response be? And if you listen to the debate that's going on at the crime bill, the only response we seem to be able to come up with in this country is to lock them away. 
build more prisons, lock more people away. And at the rate we're going, today we have a million people in the United States that are locked up in either prisons or jails. A million people. And if we continue at the rate we're going, that number is going to be far exceeding a million in no time at all because all of the systems, most all of the systems, I think there are two states whose population actually went down in the last five years. And I think that's um, uh, Rhode Island or Delaware and New Hampshire, I think. But just about every other system is going up relatively significantly, especially the larger states. Let me pause for a moment and just turn it over to you. Any questions, any thoughts, anything that I've said so far that stimulates a thought or that you don't understand or yes there's been a lot of controversy over the crime field can you explain the elements in the crime field and tell us how that will affect you okay there are several elements in the crime bill that are directly connected to corrections and others that affect the whole criminal justice system in general uh, one of the ones that's most near and dear to our hearts and I just testified before Congress two weeks ago on that one, and that's the regional prisons. One of the proposals in there is that uh, the federal government should build and operate 25,000 prison beds that will hold 75% state inmates, and then the other 25% would be federal inmates. And we will build them, and we will run them, and they've set aside anywhere from 3 to $6 billion to cover the cost of these, these uh, uh, institutions. We argued very strongly against them, as did all the representatives from the state, legislators, and governors' association of corrections, because we believe, number one, the federal government doesn't need to get into the state's business. The whole issue of federalism and the federalizing more and more and more laws is making it really unclear anymore where the state's responsibility begin and end and when, where should the federal government get involved. And we're really getting right in the middle of state's business if we're going to start running prisons to hold state inmates. There's a lot of other operational reasons, but then there's a very practical reason that that three or six billion dollars they're talking about using for these prisons will be eaten up in a couple of years. And then where's the money going to come to continue operating them? Once those 25,000 beds are built, it's going to cost a billion dollars a year to operate them. And that's your federal tax dollars paying for them. And so there's a big debate over the cost of the, the reaction to the crime bill. The other provision is the three strikes you're out provision. Is that anyone who is convicted of three violent offenses gets an automatic life sentence. No debate, no discussion. Three violent offenses, you go away for life. Now, on one hand, that sounds good because we don't want violent people out there repeatedly committing crimes against our citizens. But what's happening in Washington state where they passed the three strikes you're out bill, they didn't define violent offense very carefully. They just considered the entire spectrum of whatever the technical definition is of violent offense. And there's a gentleman there that's been profiled along the news lately, and he's committed three minor robberies of like grocery stores where he's gotten maybe 100 bucks in each robbery. The last one, he walked in with his finger in his pocket and threatened the person, you know, that they, he would harm them if they didn't give the money. He now is looking at the likelihood of getting a, a life sentence for three minor robberies. So the concern with the crime bill on the three strikes you're out provision is that we define violent very carefully because everyone would agree that the horrible, awful, nasty, nasties that are preying upon the vulnerable in our, in our country, the rapists, the serial murderers, just the heinous offenders, we want them locked away. I don't want them back in my community. I don't think you do either. But they make up a very small percentage of the offenders who are going to get caught in this three strikes you're out thing unless violent, violent offense is defined very, very carefully. And the Department of Justice is working right now on its own much tighter definition of who we mean. The other piece of that debate is if, if, you get, if you're 30 years old and you've committed three violent offenses and we're going to lock you away for life, you know how much it's going to cost to hold that person after they become 50, 60, 70 years of age or 80 years of age? That's extremely expensive. And the reality is the likelihood of someone recidivating after 55 years of age drops off significantly. So is lifetime incarceration really what we want to uh, lock our grandchildren to paying for 30 years down the road when these folks become 60, 65, 70 plus years of age? I'm not sure that's a real wise thing to do. 
uh, unless, again, you so narrowly define that violent grouping that you really are talking about those who you really do want to lock away and you're willing to pay for for a lifetime. There's provisions in there for 100,000 police presence, what the president talks about a lot, believing that the more and more police presence we can have in communities can serve a preventive role, especially if they get involved with the communities and can really offset a lot of the, uh, the factors that are leading to crime in the communities. Um, geez, there's a whole myriad of provisions. Uh, there are some that raise some min minimum mandatory laws and some new offenses. One that gives a year off if you complete drug treatment programs in the federal prison system. That's the only window for us that's going to reduce our population a little bit. Every single other element is going to add to the numbers that I was talking about of shooting up in the population. And those are probably some of the, the primary pieces of the crime bill. Okay. Anybody else? I'll keep talking if you don't have anything. Okay. As an undergraduate, graduating in May, what is the qualifications and the salary if I wanted to go into the federal um, rural prison? Okay, the qualifications are roughly um, uh, a four-year college degree or three, if you don't have a four-year college degree, we'll hire you if you have, I believe it's three years demonstrated experience as a supervisor on a job supervising other people because the role of a correctional officer is primarily that of supervision, supervising the inmates. Um, we have some uh, requirements in terms of not having a, 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 an arrest record, uh, not having been involved in, in drug use. We do drug testing to make sure someone is clean and we don't hire someone that's actively using drugs. Uh, those are the primary requirements. And the, the pay starts around, I believe it's $23,000. It kind of varies because if you're going to work at our institution in New York City, there's a loca locality pay bonus that is higher than if you're going to work at our institution in Fort Worth, Texas, for example, where the cost of living is less. So if you go into high-cost areas, we pay you a little more. If you go into average or low-cost areas, the pay is pretty standard. But the average pay is around $24,000, $24, and then you promote up to $25,000, $26,000 within the first six months to a year, basically. Okay. Okay, let me, let me go on a little bit. And please, anywhere along the way, stop me and raise your hand or jump in or, or whatever. And if I say anything you don't understand, please, please stop me, okay, and, and let me explain it. We tend to talk in our own jargon in corrections, and, and if I say anything that doesn't make sense to you, stop me. You know, one of the things that I find real interesting, well, there's a lot of things I find real interesting, but I, maybe sometimes frustrating, is that I'm not sure that we as a society um, understand a whole lot more about human behavior than we understood 2,000 years ago. It frustrates me oftentimes to find that we're stu still using methods as archaic as simply locking people away today when we're supposed to be so advanced and so civilized and all of that. And when I, I watch the debate going on right now about the crime in our communities and what our response should be, the response all too quickly seems to jump to, as I said a moment ago, the answer is to simply lock more people up. And, and we don't approach the whole situation more thoughtfully, which I trust you're doing in your classes and you have the time to step back and really think about the whole continuum of crime and, and where it begins and where it ends. Unfortunately, we in terms of, of, a, of a country, in terms of trying to solve the problem, tend to only want to jump on the back end of the crime continuum, and that is to punish the offender. And what's the best, most certain punishment of that offender? Lock him up. And then you have an attorney general, Janet Reno, come into office a year ago and start saying that if we really want to slow down crime in this country, we have to go all the way back to the beginning, before the baby is even born, in prenatal care, and good ch child care, and good preschool programs, and good classrooms, and strengthening the families, and strengthening the communities. And then her detractors come in and say, she's the attorney general? She sounds more like the head of Health and Human Services talking about this. She should be talking about what to do with crime in this country, not these social service kinds of issues on the front end. But unfortunately, or fortunately, I agree absolutely with the Attorney General, in that if we only keep dealing with the back end of crime and how you punish offenders, we're going to be paying for these prisons and locking people up from now until eternity, because all we're doing down here is creating more offenders. If we don't touch the factors that contribute to crime, 
and the whole environment that creates crime in this country. And we only deal on the back end, which is locking people up and punishing them soundly. Then we're never going to slow down the rate of crime. In fact, we're probably going to increase it. And you get into the thing of what's sanction, what are sanctions supposed to be all about? What's the purpose of it? Is it punishment and only punishment? Is it deterrence? I mean, do we honestly believe that if you're about to go out and deal drugs or if you're about to go out and rob a bank, you're going to stop and say, well, let me see. If I rob this bank, I'm likely to get 10 years in jail. But, you know, I've only got a 50% chance of getting caught and a 25% chance, percent, percent chance of getting found guilty. So let's see, my odds then of going to jail are this amount, and I may end up getting then. I mean, do you think offenders really sit down and factor out what the consequences are going to be clearly to believe that any uh, sanction out there is going to be a deterrent to the average offender? Now, it might be to us. Those who function more on middle class values who are concerned about being embarrassed or embarrassing their family or bringing disrespect upon themselves or their family may be influenced by some of these deterrent issues. But most of those who get involved in crime, they're not really interested in those kinds of factors. So I question the whole deterrence argument as to whether or not that's really going to make a difference. Is the purpose simply incapacitation? Making certain that they cannot commit any more offense? Well, if you lock them away for life, you're going to guarantee they're incapacitated. But is that the only way you can ensure it? Or is it rehabilitation? Is the purpose of sanctions to really help someone become better able to live a crime-free life? I'm not sure we have, as a society have ever really decided what it is we want out of our sanctions. We kind of want all of the above or one of the above, and we want to apply that same sanction to everyone and believe that's going to make a difference, even though people are very, very different. Thoughts? Yes. Do you see any evidence anywhere that we're breaking out of that way of thinking, though? I mean, it seems that it, it, it seems that we keep recreating the same wheels over and over again. We keep focusing on punishing criminals rather than dealing with the crime problem. I, 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 do you see any hope that people are looking at it a different way? I was hopeful. <laughs> I was hopeful six months ago. I was very hopeful that we were taking another a, approach. I think with the Attorney General and the current President talking about, let's take another look at the way we're going to address crime. The debates on, Ca on Capitol Hill and the Senate and the House were beginning to be much more reasonable, still heavily on tough on crime, but moderating back a little bit to the middle. And I think I, the, the thing that I thought was really going to make it happen was the economy. If we truly wanted to reduce the deficit, we truly wanted to balance the budget, we couldn't simply continue to put tons of money into the back end of crime. I honestly was hopeful about six months ago. And the Senate was merely going along, dealing, approaching the crime bill. And then literally overnight, it reversed itself. And that was the night of the election for mayor in New York City, the election for governor in New Jersey, and the election for governor in Virginia. And all three of those elections turned on the issue of crime. All three of them. And literally overnight, Senate changed its approach. And it became, can you top this? We kept calling it in Washington. I mean, one would say, I want 10 more mandatory minimum sentences. And the other, I want 20 more mandatory minimum sentences. And we want to lock them away for 10 years. No, we're going to lock them away for 20 years. And it reached the point of such ridiculousness that Senator Biden, who's the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said that he honestly believed that if someone had put in a bill over that about week or two week period that proposed that jaywalkers should have their legs wrapped with barbed wire, Senate would have voted for it because they were in such a frenzy of, doing, of showing the public that they were tough on crime because they truly were looking at their next election and they truly believed that whether or not they were tough on crime would, would determine the election. And it, the whole thing reversed. The good thing that in the Senate went ahead and passed this very, very expensive $22, $23 billion crime bill with 99% of it going toward punishing harshly offenders and very little on the prevention side. The good thing that happened was the Senate passed that bill, but then it has to go to the House for, this, for, for their, them to deal with it, and Christmas fell in between that. The, the Christmas break fell in between the Senate's deliberations and before it got handed over to the House. And I honestly think that that, um, that, that delay period there allowed everything to settle down a little bit 
so that now when the House came back in, they're approaching it a little more reasonably. The Senate did not have a single hearing on the crime bill. They had no one come in and talk with them about any of the bills that they were passing. You know, the experts in the field or the folks from academia or all the different ones that could educate the Senate on what they were proposing. They didn't have a single hearing on the crime bill when they passed the bill. The House now is slowing down, having some hearings, and we're hoping that something a little more reasonable is going to come out of it. One of our own legislators here in Texas has referred to this notion of uh, building more prisons to solve crime. He uses the analogy that if we responded to the AIDS crisis simply by building more hospitals, people would look at it and say that's insane. Mm -hmm. That's not the way to deal with the, with the public health crisis, simply by building hospitals where people will go to die of AIDS. Yet yeah, that's exactly the way we're responding to uh, crime problems by building institutions. And one of your legislators here in, in uh, Texas is at the front of that pack, too, a Phil Graham, your senator, who's taking a very strong, hard on crime stance. And anyone that tries to say anything other than that, uh, that, well, you know, maybe we should slow down a little bit and think about this, they're immediately pounced upon as being soft on crime, soft on crime. And it's become a political football. And, and the issue is immediately polarized. You know, if, if, if you were to say what you just said, you'd immediately be labeled soft on crime by your opponents. But everyone wants to appear hard on crime. The reality is we need to be somewhere there in the middle where we're reasonable on crime, where we're making sense on crime, and not simply polarizing the issue from, you know, throw the book at them to do nothing about them at all. The answer is somewhere here in the middle. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of that uh, in the next year or so because one of the reasons is Every member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election next year. And the reality is, you know, although I honestly believe that 99% of our elected officials in Washington, D.C. truly have the best interests interest of this country at heart, and they truly want to do what's right, the problem is they can only do what's right if they're in Washington, you know, if they're, they keep their seat in the Senate or the House. So they keep one foot in doing what's right for the country, and other foot, the other foot in the, the ballpark that's going to get them reelected, and they have to kind of stay within a reasonable ground there, or they risk not being reelected. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, based on your psychological experience with um, offenders, what type of prevention programs, both for juveniles and adults, do you see that most benefit them? And if we ever move to a point where we stress prevention more than building more prisons, do you think it would be? most effectively operated on the state, uh, local, or federal government. Okay. I'm going to reverse your questions and deal with the first part first, and I mean, the second part first, because I think that's the way the flow needs to go. Did you all hear her question? Her question is, what are the preventive things that, we, that I believe, from a psychological standpoint, need to occur to start directing young people away from crime? And also, if we ever get into these prevention modes, should it be done at the local, state, or federal level? and I'm going to re answer them in reverse order. I believe that if any approach is going to work, it has to be as close to home for that person as it can possibly be. Anything that's going to be done off in the distance or some, some remote, uh, remotely directed arena is just too far away from our young. When I was growing up, I didn't care about any of the world outside of me than my own little realm of experience, and I would think that's true of all of us. You know, The world is far too big to deal with when you're 13, 12 years old the world around you is big enough. It needs to start as close to home as possible. And I think the way in which we need to address it is really catching children when they're very, very young and developing in them a hopefulness for their future and a sense of uh, power over their own life and their own existence. And that they can truly, in developing that positive self-image in them and that confidence in themselves, that they're able to do good things. Because if you look at the kinds of factors in a sense of belongingness, in a sense of caring, in a sense of support, if you look at all of the factors that are leading many of our young men and some of our young women into gangs, it's exactly that. They're looking for a sense of identity. They're looking for a, a support group to watch over them and support them and assist them. They're looking for some um, image of who they are and what they are and what can, can give them a life that's better than, than they feel that they're having right now. And they end up getting into these negative groups, the gang-oriented groups, because we are not offering them enough positive things to get involved in and develop in. I met just the other day with the Attorney General 
with Jane Alexander, who's the head of the uh, National Endowment of the Arts. And she had with her some community leaders who had been doing a lot in the inner cities, uh, in, the, in the area of the, the, the creative arts. And they were um, going into the schools that were the most troubled and identifying kids who had no sense of hope, no sense of personal well-being, very low self-images, and started kind of skimming these kids off the top and getting, getting them involved in creative artistic endeavors and into acting, into music, into drama, into uh, art, into all kinds of things. And the, the, the very dramatic impact that you could see with these kids over the course of a four-year period was absolutely unbelievable. They had gone from schools where the likelihood of going to college was like 2% to having 98% of these kids going on to college, most of them with scholarships because they had increased their grades so well. And it wasn't that they skimmed off the best kids, you know, the ones who had the greatest aptitude or the greatest intelligence or any of that. They skimmed off the ones who were down the lowest. And that says to me, if you can catch them, and these kids were high school age, so they had even gone past the age where I think the kids are most moldable in terms of and most malleable in terms of touching their image of themselves. Um, and, but we need to start that very early. And if, again, listening to the Attorney General, you also need to start before that to give them biologically, physiologically, the abilities, because many of our children are born already 10 steps behind because they're born to drug-addicted mothers, alcohol-addicted mothers, or the prenatal care they received has so damaged their little systems and affected their abilities to develop properly, that they, they're born 10 steps behind the rest of us. And if we don't start touching those things, again, we're going to be paying for the back end of crime for the rest of my lifetime and probably the rest of yours too. Okay. If a kid decides when they're 12 years old they're going to be a gangster and they decide, they, they link themselves to gangsters and they live that life until they're 21, by the time they come into an adult prison system, you're not going to change them. You're just not going to change because that's who they are. And it's very important that we all know who we are. One of the things that we see in, in public opinion data, when we look at what people view as a positive time, is there's been a very, very marked shift over the last 20 years. And, and there's much less interest in recognizing social causes and much more of, of a notion that this person chooses to commit crimes or this person was, uh, was you know, the sort of born to be hung mentality. Uh, in your view, is that what drives this? I mean, we're not really concerned about broken homes and, and poor schools and nutrition programs anymore because we don't think that matters. I mean, uh, the American, American public tends to think that people join gangs out of a very functional kind of view that uh, you know, it's, it's easier and uh, that these are choices that people make. So there's, there's, very little, uh, there's very little sympathy with the notion that we ought to do anything to prevent this. Yeah. I'm going to get into opinion now more than, than thoroughly researched and, 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 and well, <laughs> deep knowledge of this subject. But I honestly believe that one of the problems, and being where I am now in government and watching what's happening, I have a little different perspective than I did when I was the brand new psychologist at Morgantown. And I think one of the problems is the public that's making these decisions that you're talking about tend to be middle class and upper class society. Making decisions about what's motivating or what's causing these things to occur with the people that we have disenfranchised for many, many generations. We've disenfranchised them because of race. We've disenfranchised them because of poverty. We've disenfranchised them in many ways. And I think all so often it's the ones who are deciding what the answer is to the problem cannot even begin to get inside the minds and the hearts and the lives of the people that they're trying to make decisions about. And I think that's why you end up with this split. It's, it's the folks who work most closely with the disenfranchised who are saying, these are the things that are going to make a difference. But it's the ones who have to make the decisions to give resources and monies and funding and all these kinds of things are on a little different plane. And we tend to, and I do too, we tend to evaluate things based upon our own perspective. And same way with those who determine what the sanctions are going to be for offenses. We determine what sanctions are going to have an effect based upon middle class values. What would affect me? I wouldn't want to rob a bank and go away for 10 years. 
but someone else is looking at it with a very different perspective. And so I think that that's why there's that, that, that difference in terms of what the solution is, because oftentimes the ones who have to make those decisions are the ones who truly least understand. And you can, you know, you can, you can tilt the thing and, and find, um, find um, substance for arguing the middle class way. Well, look, we've given them opportunities, and they've blown them. Or you go into the ghetto and you find children who had no better opportunities than this one, and this kid goes straight, and this one goes wrong. So therefore, it obviously has nothing to do with what you offered them. It's purely a matter of choice. Choice is a factor. We all have free choice. But if you limit the options that I have to choose from, then that free choice doesn't do me as much good as if I'm raised in a upper middle class neighborhood with lots of opportunities. I have a whole lot more choices that are positive ones. And if I'm growing up where the options are less, I may still have choice, but I don't have very many things to choose from. Yes. There are some people that are making fairly dire predictions about the time around year 2000 when we are, as you indicated, uh, institutionalizing, radicalizing, and criminalizing and disenfranchising such a large population of people. And at that time, given the population characteristics, it will be in a very dangerous situation where we have very elderly people who are making these decisions uh, working against a very large population of people who have been very radicalized. Uh, what do you think about these predictions? Going from opinion to, to uh, the future. That's right, yeah, to prophesizing, right? Um, you know, I, I still tend to be very optimistic. You know, it, it gets thrown sometimes and my idealism gets shaken when I watch where we're going at sometimes. But I honestly believe that we're going to get this straight one of these days pretty soon. And we're going to realize what it is that we're doing. There's a debate in the newspaper this morning in USA Today talking about drugs. And, and drugs is one of the things so strongly driving crime in this country today. And talking about the debate of the, the mayor in Baltimore who's been pushing for decriminalizing drugs. When he first started talking about decriminalizing drugs two years ago, it's Kurt Schmoke, the mayor of Baltimore. He was attacked. All the media said that he was talking about legalizing drugs. And it's taken him two years now to define for everybody that there's a significant difference between legalizing drugs and decriminalizing drugs. And what he's saying is, let's not approach all drug users as lawbreakers. Let's approach drug users, especially you know, lower level, beginning drug users, and those with, with a, a, an addiction, treat them as a medical problem that needs addressed. You'll then deal with much of your drug sales problem later on. Drug sales are illegal. But drug use, if you treat it more as a problem that this person needs help and needs drug treatment, then you'll start then turning the tide because you will not have as much of a demand for the drugs. Therefore, the supply will not be as largely needed, and you'll start then turning the drug thing. That debate is still out there, and it begins to get a little more interesting. Now, I'm not talking about legalizing drugs. Let me be real clear. I'm not the director of the Bureau of Prisons saying we should legalize drugs. But I think that if, and if you look at the new drug control program that's put out by Lee Brown and, and the president, we need to put more energy on dealing with drug, offend, drug abusers and offering drug treatment and not as much on arresting the people bringing the drugs into the country. Because as long as you have people here willing to spend money for drugs, you're going to have people willing to import them, to bring them in. And the more and more you arrest of those bringing them in, as long as people still want to buy them, there's going to be new ones selling them, right behind them. You're not going to stop our drug problem. And I think if we can start turning the tide on the drug situation and truly start doing a better job of attacking the demand problem rather than the supply problem and the economic realities of what our doing, we're doing to ourselves in this, in this uh, building prisons issue, that I believe we're going to t start turning it around at some point. I thought it was going to be last year. I think now we have to get past this election year because every member of the House of Representatives in Washington is up for re-election. We need to get past that, and then I think you might see some reasons start coming back into it. But one of the things we need to do, I honestly believe, is do a better job of educating the public. Because we, the public, tend to want to point at either your state legislatures, your state capitals, or Washington, D.C., and say, look what those awful people are doing up there. They're doing these things. They need to be fixing the problem. Instead, they're putting us farther in debt or whatever it might be. And we tend to sit out here as the American public and feel helpless. And we say it's them and those up there that are doing it to us. 
The American people need to realize that we have more power as voters than any single other person in the country because everyone in your state house and everyone in Washington are relying upon getting reelected to stay in office. They're relying on your vote. But how many voters vote and how many, once they vote, ever write their congressmen or their representatives to tell them what they want? Not very many. Not very many. And so if you really want to make your wishes known, you need to talk to those people that you've elected and sent into Washington or into Austin or wherever your home state may be. We're not powerless out here as people. And so one of the things we've been doing in the federal prison system is really trying to bring the community more into the correctional arena. Because prisons can't affect change alone. The inmate has to want to change. The prison has to offer op options. But the community then has to be willing to accept that individual back into their community in a positive way with jobs, with housing, with a, a willingness to help that person go straight. And until our communities start taking more responsibility, I think we're going to continue to have problems. It's kind of a circuitous answer to your question. I'm not sure if it got there or not. But, but I tend to be hopeful that, that we're going to start turning this around. What is your sense, as we go about building all these prisons in Texas and elsewhere, what do we expect them to do? Uh, are, what is the modern view of what the prisons are supposed to Are we looking at them as schools or as factories or simply as warehouses? I'd like to ask you that. That's one of the questions I had jotted down to myself to try to get you engaged a little bit. What do you think? What do you want? from prisons. If, if, if you're one who believes that the bad folks should be punished and one of those options of punishment should be send them away to prison, what do you expect then that prison to do? Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. Okay. What does that mean to you? Well, no. Uh, kind of telling them, making them realize what they've done is wrong and to when they leave, you know that's wrong and not do it again. Okay, make, making sure you tell them that what they've done is wrong and try to encourage them not to do it again when they go back out. How do you do that? Education training. Education training. Reprogramming. Okay, a little computer. You know, you get in there and you kind of re redo the program and they come out okay. <laughs> I wish it were as simple as, as easy reprogramming, but it is kind of a reprogramming. What else? How do we do that? Um, could you talk about classification? Because I think if we understand the classification system, okay. that would determine if we need to warehouse them, if okay. we need to rehabilitate them, if we need to do them. He was in the session I did yesterday. That's what he, he's trying to drive the way I'm going to answer this question. That's a real good point. In getting at the, at the of, of, of rehabilitation or what the purpose is of incarceration and what we try to do as a correctional system, we try to do somewhat different things for different people. If there are individuals who are, are going to be going back into the community in a relatively reasonable length of time, uh, five years, ten years, they're going to be getting out, then we try very much to do almost reprogramming through education, through trying to help them realize that the lifestyle that they've chosen so far is only going to get them back into jail again try to offer them opportunities not, over to, not only to build their skills educationally, vocationally in the workplace, but also do a, a personal reassessment through our chaplaincy programs and our psychology programs and our counseling programs to try to do some values retraining in terms of you know, what, they, what many of them coming into us value is money. Um, they value their, their peers if they're attached to some gang kind of a grouping. Uh, and they value things that get them in difficulty. And we try to work with them to kind of redirect their values in terms of their values being for freedom and their value being to, to feel good about themselves and try to shift values. But that's real hard to do when you're dealing with someone that's got a 20-year sentence, 30-year sentence, not going to be getting out for a long, long time. With many of those individuals, we try to do some of that, but it's a little harder when they're not looking at returning back to the community for a long, long time. This is really going to be their life for a major portion of their life, and it's going to be in jail. So through your classification systems, you can sort out who are the most dangerous inmates doing the most amount of time, place them in higher security institutions. You sort out those who are lower level offenders who are going to be getting out in lesser amounts of time, and you offer programs in both types of classifications of institutions 
but your, your one set on the lower end is really trying to do the rehabilitation. It's really trying to get these folks ready to go out in a positive way, ready to live a crime-free life. Now, we work at that real hard, but you know what our recidivism rate is? 40%. 40% of those that we touch come back within three years. Now, we can feel real good about the fact that that's better than the state average. I think the state average is 60%. But that still doesn't feel real good. I mean, 40% of them come back. It doesn't really start dropping off significantly until they reach 55 and older. And then it goes down to like 18% because they just get tired of being in prison. They just get tired. But even our best efforts is still resulting in a 40% recidivism rate. Um, Yes. What are some of the ways that prisons make the people worse who come through the system? Yeah, you know, that's one of the accusations that's made a lot about prison systems is that they, the person goes in and they come out worse off than when they went in. And you know, I won't say that that doesn't happen sometimes, especially in your, your more severe institutions, your harsher institutions, and especially if you don't have a good classification system. Because if you're putting your more malleable, your more moldable individuals that haven't gotten into the full-fledged big life of crime yet, and you're incarcerating them with some of these folks that, have, that are destined to be gangsters for the rest of their lives, you really have a much greater likelihood of the one group influencing the other group negatively. But I think what happens is, if, if, again, if, if they come in with kind of a, a weak self-image, not sure of who they are or who they're going to be, it's very easy for them to start aligning themselves with the bad guys, the real bad guys who have a real clear image of who they are, and they're bad guys. They're the gangsters or the, the bad girls because we have plenty of those too. Um, and so I think it's very important and we try very hard to separate out these populations so that you don't put the younger, more vulnerable, more malleable uh, self-concepts in there with the ones who are destined to a life of crime because they can very much influence the other. If Also, if you don't offer them hope, one of the, the biggest things that we risk in prison is when someone loses hope because most ever, when everyone comes in, they're hopeful that they're going to get out early. They're hopeful that they're not going to come back again. There's a fair amount of hope on the part of most of your offenders when they come in. It's one of the fears we have with losing parole and minimizing good time and some of these long, long sentences, and especially the discussion of giving life sentences with no parole to a lot more offenders. And that is when they walk in that door, there is no hope. There is no likelihood to get out earlier. There's not a darn thing you're going to do to change that sentence. And if you've got a life sentence or you've got the death sentence, there's not a whole lot you're going to do to change any of that. And when you lose hope, you lose the primary motivator, and that's when they're absolutely likely to be... Uh, influenced far more negatively by the negative peers around them than they are by anything positive you try to do. And when we get someone in that's 25 and they're looking at a 20-year sentence, as far as they're concerned, that is a life sentence. Because when you're 25 or younger, you folks, and you imagine yourself my age, 43, that's probably a lifetime away to you. And the thought of not getting out again for 20 years is a long, long time. Yes. What would be the worst for you? No drug treatment program or a phony drug treatment program? Well, probably no would be worse. Because, although phony sure isn't a whole lot better. But one of the concerns with, with having folks in, in prison is you have to have something constructive for them to be doing. Idle hands, idle minds are just disaster in a prison setting. So even if you've got a weak drug treatment program, that is not going to have dramatic effects in terms of stopping their drug usage down the road. At least it's something that, that's, that's, that's semi-positive uh, um, that's keeping them occupied. Now, that's in terms of dealing with the offenders themselves. It becomes worse to have a phony one than no if you're seeking resources. If you're going to your legislature and you're trying to get monies, or you're trying to get support, and you've got a phony one in there, and it's going okay, then what they're going to say is, why do you need any more money for one? You've got a drug treatment program going there right now. So that's where we hurt ourselves with weak ones or phony ones. We pretend like we've got them. Uh, and so our legislatures will say, well, we're not going to give you any more money because you've already got one going. 
Or we don't even seek more money because all we want is credit on paper for having a drug treatment program. But it's really going to have absolutely no impact upon these folks when they go back out into the community. And you can have a great drug treatment program inside your institution, but if you don't carry that program out with them as they go back into the community where they're most vulnerable, it's not much better than a phony program. Because you do all this great treatment, and then when they most need you, when they're walking back into their home community where all those old temptations are there, then you're gone from them. And that's what we used to do in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We did a great job inside with drug treatment when drugs were hardly at all available to them and the threat and the temptation wasn't there real strongly. And then when they were ready to be released, we were finished. We handed them off to probation or parole who didn't always pick up the ball. And a lot of these folks fell right back into drugs again. So our current drug treatment program, we emphasize the transition of them back into the community just as much as we emphasize the treatment while they're inside. We actually hook them up with a drug treatment program that has the same philosophical direction as the one in our inside so that that same line of treatment continues after they get out there because that's when they really need it, when you're go, going back into your old haunts, your old temptations. And, and we're, we're very hopeful. It's not been going long enough to be able to track it over a long time to see the effects of our, our new program with the strong transition program. But we're very optimistic that it's going to have a good effect. Yes? Um, I think maybe part of the problem for the recidivism rate is you can take an inmate, one that's going to get out five years, you can train them, you can educate them. But once they get back into the community, if they've been convicted of a felony, they can't get a certain job or they can't live in a certain housing. How do you think we can educate the public okay. to change their opinions and give people a second chance? That's, that's an excellent point, and that's what I was starting to touch on when I was saying we need to get the community more involved. There's a few things I think you can do. One is um, some, some states have real good mentoring programs where an inmate being released or, or a voluntary probation period, uh, program where private citizens volunteer to be mentors, we tend to call them more in this country, or volunteer probation officers or parole officers and really help these individuals coming out one-on-one -on -one with jobs, with housing, with kind of developing new friendship groups and, and new associations. There are organizations that do that. A lot of the halfway houses that we use, we don't run any of the halfway houses anymore back in the community. They're all done by private contractors because what we found is those people have to live in that community. They have to have all kinds of connections to, to, the, to the job market there, to the social service agencies, to, to the housing authority. They really have to be able to run interference for those offenders coming out to get them started again on, the, on a good footing. One of the other things that we've been doing is bringing more and more of the community into our institutions. We have 7,000 community volunteers that come into our institutions around the country because what that serves to do is changes the, uh, the mental image that people have of prisoners. Because if prisons stay that, that mysterious place behind the wall, like the walls down here, or behind the fence, and, and people only can watch the old James Cagney movies or the Clint Eastwood movies or the Paul Newman movies to know what goes on behind those walls and fences, they have a very different image of who these people are. So that when these people are going to come back out into their communities, it's like, no, 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 don't let them be near me. So what we've been doing is bringing as, as many people as we can get to come in into our institutions to start working with these inmates, either in education programs or religious programs or recreation programs or drug programs or anything we can get them involved in so that they end up with a different image of who these people are. And so they are much more willing to work with them upon release. The other thing, we're starting to work with labor unions. And some state systems do this better than us. And they're able to link actual employers out there to inmates who are coming out of their facilities so that if they, they get the particular vocational training they may need or job training in the institution, they're linked them then to the job market when they go out there so they have an advantage. But I don't think we as a criminal justice system in this country have done a real good job of linking, transitioning our offenders out of whatever the sanction may be back into mainstream life in our communities. I think that's where we failed ourselves probably as strongly as anywhere else is making that connection back for them. That's why so many of them fail and come back in again. Here in Texas, we often hear, I hear it on average three times a week, two things. One is the problem is prisons aren't punitive enough uh, and people don't fear them. And 
there. Inmates are laying up there with cable TV and the cells and, and the law libraries and all that kind of stuff. And that's the real problem. The second observation that's almost always coupled with that is that we need to go back to the good old days when prisons were self-supporting. When a particular image in southern prisons is of the chain gang and people out picking cotton and, and under the hot sun all day long and that kind of stuff. And those two themes work together. That, that they're not punitive enough and we're not working the inmates hard enough. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you respond to those? <laughs> Particularly about the tension of putting inmates to work. Okay. Yeah, that's, you know, when any, whenever any, that's a wonderful question. Whenever anyone visits our institutions, if we have a group come through our institutions, you can usually almost draw a line down the middle and say half the group's going to say the institution's too nice, the other half's going to say the institution's too harsh. Same institution, you get absolutely polarized opinions from the average person when they go into a facility as to whether it's too, now, if you get into the higher, some of you went to see the walls the other day. I would trust that your reaction to that is that it's probably a little more punitive than, than nice, would you say? Or did you even find it to be nice? I thought it was very, it was a lot better than I expected. Okay, okay. Any other thoughts on the walls? Only one person went. <laughs> Any other thoughts on the walls? No? Okay, okay. That's, it's interesting that even if our high, if even our high security institutions look pretty nice to people, then we really are uh, uh, confusing our mission a little bit. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a constant tension for, for corrections administrators to know what's the right way to incarcerate people. Some of the nice things we do for inmates, we do more for control reasons than anything else. Uh, Jesse Helms, one of our nemesis in, in the Senate, says there should be no more air conditioning, no more television sets, let alone color television sets in prisons. And uh, I think it's isn't the governor of Arizona saying recently that we need to go back to the old break and rocks thing and just have them work all day, 10 hours a day, doing anything, even if it's, if it's nonsense work that has no functional purpose, but just breaking rocks just to punish them by working them 10 hours a day. I don't want to be the prison administrator running that institution. Can you imagine having 12, 1,500 inmates in Texas with no air, no, um, no air conditioning, no cool air in the summertime, nothing to occupy their minds, as, 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 as negative as perhaps a TV can be in terms of occupying minds, but nothing to occupy their minds. They've got lots of time after the, even you work them for 10 hours a day doing nothing that's meaningful. So they end up being angry about that. They're hot. They're tired. They're feeling punished, all right. But then you've got to manage them for X number of years. You have them in the institution, and then you're going to let them out the door. Because 98% of all inmates come back to your communities. Now, I would argue that you're going to have a lot more negative, nasty person coming out the door after their time is up if that's the way in which you dealt with their incarceration. Now. I agree absolutely that every inmate needs to work. And in our system, we require every single inmate has to work or a combination of work and school for eight hours a day. The work could be being the cook in food service, being the orderly in your unit where you clean up. It could be being a typist, uh, helping out in the business office. It could be learning plumbing with the plumbing foreman or elect electrical or elect, becoming an electrician, or it could be working in our federal prison industries program where we actually manufacture furniture and cable harnesses and clothing and sell it to the federal government. You have to work eight hours a day. What happens, though, when you end up overcrowding your institutions, and right now our institutions are about 35% over capacity, our higher security institutions are about 50 to 55% over capacity, there's not enough work to go around. So you start making up jobs for inmates. And you maybe have four inmates doing the job that one could very easily do. And what you end up then with is a lot of idle time on their minds. Because they're just kind of hanging around, pretending to be working, but there really isn't a lot of work for them to do. Now, do you replace that then by having them carry these rocks from this end of the yard over to that end? And then once they get them on that end, you have them carry them back? I mean, you just do make work stuff? All that does is make people angry. No one likes to be abused. No one likes to be treated unfairly or made to do something that is just stupid. 
So you're always trying to balance making sure you have enough there to do that is reasonable and meaningful, not making the individual more angry or more foul than they already are because 98% of them are getting back and while they're in there, our staff have to live with them. Yes? Obviously, what these people are thinking through or backing is breaking up theory or whatever are focusing on deterrence. When you say... In punishment. Both of those. Deterrence and punishment. Do you not think that it would deter anyone at all? Think that, well, maybe I shouldn't commit this robbery because I am going to be breaking up and I'll do that all the time? I think it may deter some, but I think that would be a, a small percentage of the people that come to jail. I truly do. Because I used to talk with the inmates all the time about, you know, where, especially when I functioned for eight years as a psychologist. That's all I did was talk with inmates about what brought them to jail. And very, very few of them were really thinking at all about the consequence of their action when they committed their offense. And the consequence of their action was not at all the most significant thing to them when they opted to commit an offense. Okay? Because a lot of the folks that come to jail, their parents were in jail, their brother's in jail, their sister's in jail, someone in their family's in jail. Or if you're growing up in some of the settings where criminal behavior is common, it's a rite of passage. In Washington, D.C., it's like a stripe on their arm if they've made a trip to the D.C. jail. They've, they've, they've grown in status with their friends. Now, again, for middle class values, it would probably deter us because I don't want to be working in the hot sun breaking rocks for 10 hours. But they used to work in the hot sun breaking rocks for 10 hours how many decades ago, and that sure didn't stop them from coming in and breaking laws. So I just don't think the deterrence effect, is, number one, it's not going to keep many of them out, and it's certainly not going to make them more ready to come out positively oriented toward living constructively in their communities and feeling good about the communities they're going back to. But you, you don't want to be too nice, though, either, because at the same time you run the risk of making prison an absolutely no threat. We had an inmate that we tried to throw him out of the front door of the institution and he didn't want to go. We finally just sat him out on the street. He went out and broke into a post office to come back in again because he had nobody outside that cared about him. He had a better support system in prison and got three meals a day, medical treatment, all those kinds of things, and he really didn't want to go back out. So there's some magic line someone, somewhere in between those two issues. To be, between treat, and the other thing that's come in is over the last several years, with the American Civil Liberties Union and all the other advocacy groups protecting the rights of the inmates, that today most inmates I would venture to say have more rights than we have, than staff have. Because so many of the things that we, we have to provide law libraries, we have to provide a certain, I mean, just there's so many things that are required now by court. And I mean, th this state of all that's under court order and all the jail systems that are under court order because they haven't met the measure of what the court says uh, keeps them under the cruel and unusual punishment level. Uh, many of the niceties are required by law. So you're, as a prison administrator, you're always balancing between you know, how much is enough to make it punitive and when do you cross that line to make it so punitive that it's counterproductive and when do you become too nice. We're building a lot of new institutions and when people walk in our new institutions, they say they're too nice. They're bright, they're colorful, they're spacious, they're airy, they're too nice. They're made out of concrete block we put in the metal stairwells and, and, and pink paint or blue paint or green paint costs the same amount as gray paint. And blue tile on the floor costs the same as gray tile. And so just by adding some things that make it a more decent environment for staff to work in and inmates to live in, they tell us they're too nice. So should we go back and put in all gray paint and gray tile? and make the rooms small and oppressive, which are also very hard to supervise. You need more staff to supervise a lot of chopped up areas than you do open and spacious areas. Should we not have recreation areas? Our average, average inmate age is 35, 36 years old. Can you imagine what it would be like to have 1,200 men or more or women locked up in a space with no place 
to, in a constructive way to expend the energies they have pent up, what are they going to do? They're going to fight. They're going to riot. They're going to take it out on each other. They're going to take it out on staff. Is that a better way to run a prison? Some folks would say yes. I sure have a heck of a, a, heck of a time hiring people to work there. <laughs> we have time for only one more okay. question. I'm going to exert my, my prerogative as a teacher to ask you, why don't we just take this whole prison business and turn it over to private companies? Okay. We do that for so many things. In my neighborhood, a private company comes and takes some garbage away and takes it to a place where I can't see it. Why don't we just hire private companies to come take our social garbage away and take it off to places where we don't have to see it? Ooh, social garbage away. Out of sight, out of mind. That's okay. Um, there's a couple of things that come into play when you talk about private prisons. One is the responsibility of government. Is it correct for government to turn over to private sector some of its most uh, basic responsibilities. And many people will argue that incarceration that can result in having to use physical force on these people, can result in you having to shoot these people if they're trying to escape, can result in, 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 in consti the constitutional care that they're getting because they're always still in the custody of the Attorney General on the federal level, even if they're in a private prison, they're still under the custody of the Attorney General. Should she abdicate that responsibility and put it in the hands of private prisons? That's one debate that goes on in private prisons. The other side is that pr private prisons where they've proven themselves to do well, we use them a lot. We don't run any more of our community corrections or halfway house programs at all because we believe private S systems do it a whole lot better than we can because they're much closer to the community. They do a much better job. They've demonstrated they do a good job in minimum security and in low security. Out of 84 private prisons or f private facilities that exist in this country right now, the Department of Justice is the greatest user of all of those. Between us, the Marshal Service, and immigration, we, use, we are the primary contractor in more of those private prisons and private facilities than anybody else. But most of those are all low security, or detention facilities where people were held for a short time. I don't believe yet that private prisons have demonstrated their ability when you get up into the higher security levels, the mediums and the high. In jail systems, I mean jail settings they have because of short-term detention, they're secure. But two issues. We, we have 2,000 inmates in contract low and medium security beds right now simply because we didn't have room for them. In one of those facilities, the inmates rioted. The staff left. The staff walked out the door, called us, and said, your inmates are rioting. You better come get them under control. That didn't do real well for our attitude about private prisons. Just yesterday at a private prison, we had an inmate who had only been there for two weeks, so he didn't have a long time to dig, dug his way out of the private prison, and he's, he's, he's escaped. They've not demonstrated themselves yet strongly enough in this country to handle long-term secure populations because they work on a profit margin and they're always trying to make sure they keep their costs within a profit margin area and so where they do well and then we use them a lot but we're just a little wary of, of the attorney general abdicating her responsibility for security and especially when you get a higher security because there you've got much more likelihood you're going to fight these inmates you may have to, to shoot them if they're trying to escape uh, you may have to do use of force operations on them and your special operations response teams and I think you just get into a real, real wary kind of a situation when you hand that over to private sector because the government has basically ducked from under its responsibility. Would you like to make one more pitch for these young people to consider corrections as a career? You know, I, I've been in corrections now 21 years, as I told you, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's, a, it's such a, if you're interested in, in human behavior, if you're interested in making a difference, if you're interested in a job that's never mundane, <laughs> it's never boring, um, in, in a place where you really can serve society, we believe, very strongly, because all of our people are, are civil servants. They're, they're doing what they believe helps to protect society and also send people back out, then corrections is a wonderful, wonderful field. Whether it be state corrections or federal corrections, although I'm biased, um, I really would recommend to you to consider a field of corrections because uh, I, wouldn't, I would trade maybe a few days <laughs> that I've had in the last 21 years, but I wouldn't really trade much of any of it because it really is an exciting career. And I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you.